My computer is showing 2.30. Very good. Um, I think we can get started. All righty. Um, good afternoon once again for those of you who are not today on threat assessment in schools. I'm proud to introduce our presenter today, Dr. Eric Fraser. He is a charter member of the Alliance. And Dr. Fraser is a licensed clinical psychologist with a specialization in forensic psychology. In addition to his very busy private practice, he is an assistant clinical professor at Yale University School of Medicine, and he's involved in their psychology fellow training program. Dr. Fraser's services include assessment and psychological testing for private and court-related matters, and school safety consultation addressing bullying, sexting, and other aspects of mitigating school violence. In this capacity, he provides workshops and in-service training. And as if that wasn't enough to keep him busy, he volunteers as a court-appointed special advocate and serves as a guardian at Leiden for children and probate court. And as I mentioned before, Dr. Fraser is a chapter author for the uh, recently released e-book, Halt the Violence by the Alliance. For fun, his hobbies are ice climbing and mountaineering, where he also practices risk management and threat assessment. So I'm very happy now to turn the presentation over to Dr. Eric Fraser. Thank you so much, Beth. That was a lovely uh, introduction, and I'm really delighted to be here. I want to say that um, it's just been a proud opportunity to get to know Pat and the, the rest of the Alliance members. It's a real consortium of, of unbelievably uh, trained and educated and experienced professionals and um, I think it would, it would be terribly hard to find a knowledge base and of such professionals in a small area. Um, I'm getting a little feedback, Tony. I don't know if you could uh, close the mic off. So let me get started on this presentation, um, and I'll let you handle the, uh, the audio issues. Um, my introduction speaks for itself, I think. Um, school threat assessment is a super hot topic in Connecticut, and um, I've just been go making the rounds in all of the school systems, um, consulting in one way or another in, in a number of workshops. And the basis for that here in Connecticut is that we just had a new law that was passed that really addressed the bullying issues. but it really expanded the school's responsibility for preventing bullying, for intervening, for managing incidents of threat, how to document them, how to report those findings, and then, of course, the real how-to specifics. How do you go about setting up um, a, a school-wide, school system-wide program that can manage and monitor these issues? So I am uh, very, very quickly today in our 30-minute webinar, go through some really important bullets, try to give you as many specifics as you can over a very, very broad range of topics. Um, do know that there's more information, of course, in the book, and then, of course, if you have any additional questions afterwards, I'd be delighted to share more information with you um, pursuant to your request so we can advance this initiative for promoting a safe school climate and, uh, and school safety issues that are paramount to our children today. Um, goes without saying, threats come from a lot of different places. Some of the most obvious places is mental health problems. Um, another aspect is just raw violence. You know, kids make threats because they're angry, and then anger turns into violence, and that's the, 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 the contextual foundation for, for a threat. Of course, another is just ignorance, just not knowing any better, not knowing a better way to resolve conflict. And this is where education is such a, a key component in having school-wide education programs that teach school safety and teach alternatives for conflict resolution have, um, of course, in a very evidence-based format, made significant impacts and differences uh, at school-wide levels. And then, of course, we live in the social media world. Here we are. Situational convergence is what I um, call another another core area where threat comes from. So you have maybe family systems, you know, illustrated by the image on the left. You've got social media and then you've got texting and um, adolescent and tween issues coming into place. And it's the interaction between these that sometimes 
can turn someone feeling angry to uh, an, an angry thought um, blowing up into a threat and then blowing up into an act of violence. Now, as I was alluding to earlier, school systems um, are no longer just places to learn and become educated. And I got a lot of laughs out of um, my last school presentation last week. I said, guess what, everyone? You're in the safety business now. And you're not only in the safety business, you're in the safety business by law. And that's essentially what, what happened with Connecticut. Um, they came down with a, a lot of statutory regulations about what schools can and can't do. But today, just again, to, to bullet some of the objectives, you know, we'll take a look at some of the evidence-based practices, we'll look at a case study or two, I'm going to talk very quickly about some threat assessment procedures, and then solutions looking ahead. This is um, an excerpt from Public Law, Connecticut 11-232, and, and the applicability to this for everyone who's not from Connecticut is, um, again, a lot of the uh, initiatives and interventions that schools are getting uh, involved in in terms of school threat assessment, in terms of preventing school shootings, preventing bullying is coming down statutorily. So if you're not sure where your state stands on this, you know, go and do a, a Google search of bullying laws in your particular state and it should pull everything up and, and you'll be able to see it. This, of course, highlights the notion that every child has a right to learn um, and the words that it uses is very interesting. They use the word teasing, humiliation, assault, you know, so we're really covering the gamut of things and, and Connecticut law, and we won't get into a whole lot of detail, but it was very interesting to me to see sort of the, um, the knowledge base of the legislatures who wrote this law up and really included important things like cyberbullying and, and public humiliation and things that Johnny was pointing out earlier that are just, you know, everyday headlines nowadays. Again, here's some, some more excerpts from this written, oral, electronic, cyberbullying, physical. This is what the anti-bullying bill uh, addresses. And then secondly, is it speaks about students um, being placed in fear or their fear fear of their property being removed. That's another oh, big issue. Excuse me, Dr. Fraser? Yes. I'm sorry, Inter are you advancing the slides? Um, we're still on the, the first title slide. You're still on the sure first slide. An overview. All right. So, yeah, I'm moving forward. How is this now? Now we're seeing your, your editing page, which is great. We can see the, the materials now. It's just that first slide was not actually advancing before. All right. Let's see if, let's see if we move forward here. Is it advancing now? Uh, we've got a blank screen. Is it black? Um, I wonder if it's a, if it's a Mac um, point. And one idea where I've done this actually when I was doing this live on, on a Mac, we just advanced the slides and you could like expand that. We'll still see your slide deck on the left, but at least we could see your, your slides. Yep. So let's just use the editing screen and move along and not waste anyone's time. Is is the full Thank slide you. visible right here? Uh, yes, we're, we could, the, the title of the slide is, is missing from my view, but um, we do see the, the bulk of, of it. Okay. How's this? Very good. I, I see it at all now. Your whole slide. Okay. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. So, okay. So back on back on the, on board. <clears throat> so essentially, you know, the, the the message here is that the law is reflecting psychological issues. The law is reflecting emotional issues. The law is considering emotional and psychological harm. It's it's including um, cyber harm, if you will. Um, in the context of cyber bullying. So it was a very well thought about statute. Now, another important point, infringes on the rights of students. So we're talking about rights to learn, rights to be educated, substantially disrupts the education process. And then the last point is really, really, I think one of the most profound um, pieces of information in the law. And here's why. Based on an actual or perceived differentiating characteristics such as race, socioeconomic status, appearance, or any other kind of disability. So here you see it's not just what a student victim reported happened or what a witness reported happened, it's what they perceived. And if what they perceived varied slightly, it still doesn't matter. It means that the school is required to investigate this issue, document this issue, document the report and bring resolution to it one way or another. So it's actual or perceived, which I think is, it, it puts a lot of responsibility on school systems, um, but it also leaves virtually no room for any question of whether 
there was a threatening incident or not. So if a student perceives that they were threatened, harassed, bullied, teased, etc., it's something that's going to get investigated um, at least by, by requirement in the state of Connecticut. Uh, somewhat of a model program, if you will. Now, the whole notion is to have a safe school climate. They set up this paradigm. How are you supposed to do it? Anonymous reporting. So we have some built-in pr protective uh, measures built into the statute, which is really key. So if you're, if you're in a position of designing this and determining, you know, how do, I, how do we architect something that's enforceable? Well, this is what Connecticut law did. It said that anybody who reports bullying can do so anonymously. You don't have to um, give your name, your social security number, et cetera. Parents can file reports. So now there's no, uh, there's no retaliation for parents. Once a report is made, there's one day to respond to it. And then there's three days after uh, an incident is orally reported, it has to be documented in writing and submitted to school administration, which in most cases is the assistant principal or the pr principal. And then, then, of course, the, the law uses the word, the investigation is conducted promptly. Um, it doesn't give a specific timeline because um, for obvious reasons. You know, this is a logistical issue, but it does underscore the notion of timeliness to it. Okay, next. There's a school safe, a safe school climate specialist, and if you look at some of the literature, there's a lot of um, write-up about threat assessment teams, and I'm going to talk about that in about five, seven minutes. But basically, the notion is that you have to have a point person who leads the any kind of inquiry or investigation on school threat assessments, and Connecticut calls that a school a safe school climate specialist. The statute requires not only an intervention but prevention. Okay, so hopefully we can reduce or ultimately eliminate doing these threat assessment evaluations because we've got a prevention program in place that funnels these issues out and they get dealt with and before they can uh, rise to the level of needing a school threat assessment. And then of course the requirement is this all has to be in the code of conduct and the student handbooks. So if you're in charge of writing a school, you know, a school handbook or marking it up, this is the kind of language that needs to be in there. So there's, so there's a common understanding by the school body school administration, parents of students, um, very important. There has to be parity, otherwise it's an ineffective. Then you're dealing with uh, incident by incident. And then, of course, everyone's invited to a meeting. So there's no more uh, closed-door meetings and handling these issues. Everything is out on the table. Everything is uh, open to the public. So um, perpetrators and their parents have a meeting with, with the threat assessment team and school administration, and, and the same for the victims. Now, there's a specific uh, procedure for doing these investigations, but the real important thing is a lot of people in the past um, in all these kinds of bullying, teasing, cyber texting, cyber stalking issues, there's always a fear of retaliation. Well, the, the law took that into consideration, and they said that retaliation is absolutely prohibited. And if a student tries to retaliate against another student, they've broken the law in essence and, and they will face the consequence of expulsion is ultimately what would, would, what would happen in a real world scenario. The other interesting thing that came out, um, and this ties into school shooters, is the notion of documenting not only case by case but tracking to see if there's repeat victims and repeat perpetrators. Because one of the um, points that we know about kids that go on to become very violent in school and, and school shooters is that there were that there were repeated incidents of victimization or perpetration. So obviously it's a very standalone um, factor to assess, but it's something that, again, is being required to be documented. And I, I would support that regardless of the state that you're in. Then, of course, there's the safety plan. And having a safety plan, this is how you get closure on the incident. Um, you have to have a safety support plan. So if you're an educator, you're familiar with, be, with the behavioral support plans and the behavioral interventions for special ed issues and that sort of thing. So here we have a safety support plan in place. And then um, lastly, but not leastly, uh, if there's any attorneys on the call, this would be of interest to you that the statute wrote this, uh, this up that basically said that the employees of the school system, the Board of Ed, informants are all protected and cannot be sued in a civil lawsuit as long as they were acting in good faith. This is huge because this ultimately protects everyone. This takes, um, takes the concern away from the school system about doing a thorough investigation, maybe asking intrusive questions, um, all for purposes, of course, of maintaining a safe school climate. 
but this was seen as an intrusive and, and, and overstepping the boundaries. Well, now they're protected to do that, and they're protected from being retaliated against if, for, for example, a bad judgment call was made. So if someone was um, mis, mislabeled or misidentified somewhere along the investigation process as being a perpetrator, and then it was later corrected, but it disrupted the child's education, now they can't be sued for it, because as long as they were doing it in good faith, then it certainly wasn't an intentional act, and it's not going to get dragged into the court system. Um, on the other hand, if, there's, um, if there was concern about retaliation or if there was other legal concern about legal leverage, people of influence, you know, now the school is protected to go full throttle against a perpetrator, against a, a victim, where maybe they, they may have been hesitant to do that in the past. So there's a lot more protective barriers in place, really, really cutting-edge law, cutting-edge, and if you don't want to take it as law, you can at, at very minimum take it as guidelines. And it's really very cutting-edge guidelines how to assemble a threat assessment team and assemble some um, specific steps in having everyone's, uh, everyone in their respective roles and then how to document and then how to make that a school and district-wide policy. Okay, let's talk about um, threats, teasing, and bullying. The, the notion here, I'm just going to slide this, this down a little bit, is that I like to think about these, these at a conceptual level um, outside of a case-by-case -case scenario. And the notion is that all of these issues can range from mild to severe. Uh, the commonality is that threats, teasing, and bullying can all lead to violence. And this is obviously what we want to prevent from happening. The way to do so is putting some kind of safety intervention in place, putting that in between. And this is where today the focus, of course, is on threat assessment. That's an intervention to prevent violence. But there's obviously a host of prevention programs for all of these issues that are recommended first-line steps to correcting this concern. Now, really important to have some understanding about how do you define a threat, because all threats are not the same. And basically, uh, the literature supports this notion of having two kinds of major threats. One is a transient threat, which is basically someone says something and they set it out of context. Um, they may have made a threatening remark, I ought to shoot that kid, um, but there's really no intent of harm. It was just something said at the moment, there was no capacity to do it, there's no means to do it, there was no plan or intention to carry it out. It was basically what we, what we typically call some kid saying something stupid. Um, Substant substantive threats, there's two kinds. They're serious and very serious. Okay? The bottom line is serious is something that where there's a genuine assault that's threatened, a specific contextually driven event. Okay? So this say, I'm going to get you after school, I'm going to beat you up, um, or there's a particular location involved. This is something that's taken very seriously. I'm gonna, and very seriously rises to the level on two criteria. One is the student makes a threat with a weapon, knife, could be a gun, could be a Molotov cocktail, and the notion of lethality. This is going to be the end of your life. This is going to be the end of you. You're not going to live to see the next day. Okay? That's when you have a substantive, very serious threat. And that's uh, basically the way to make a, a, a distinction in, uh, at the very onset of, of your case. Now, <clears throat> again, the important is the notion of, well, how do we know? And it, this gets in right into the, the heart of being able to reliably predict. We know that we're not good at predicting these incidents, which is why we take a forensic approach to this. Uh, the forensic approach, of course, is we use multiple sources of data to support an opinion that's within psychological certainty. That's how we get closure on these incidents. If this is not a, a solo interview that's done with a student, and then you make a decision about whether or not there's a risk or not. Okay? So that's just the sort of the cautionary statement slide. I want to talk just for a second about this case. This was a school shooting. Unfortunately, it was lethal. It happened on January 6th out in the Midwest. The assistant principal died. The custodian and the school security officer were shot at. Um, the principal survived. And this is an exercise that I did. If you go into the school shooter research, the key findings that was published by the U.S. Secret Service and the, and the U.S. Department of uh, Education, um, if you go through the 10 checklists, which we don't have time to do here today, you'll see that uh, Robert Butler really met criteria, in, in my mind, for seven and possibly eight out of the, out of the 10 criteria. So it's a good case, uh, it's a good study case to go back and re-engineer what happened with it, and we don't have time to talk about all the details. Um, a telling point that brings us 
into the modern age is what his Facebook post said. And essentially, it's an apology, and it's also a suicide note, because he did end up um, shooting himself after the incident took place in a parking lot. And of course, he posted this on his Facebook account right before the whole event took place. Very sad, very tragic. Um, but again, it speaks to a lot of the psychological and emotional issues which could have been addressed, identified, treated beforehand, and that event could have been prevented. Very sad, sad case, very sad scenario. And these are just some of the issues that was going on. He had access to a weapon. His father was a police officer. There was uh, a recent divorce. So again, the whole notion of, of having a significant loss is, is highly important. And this is where you can find um, a really interesting um, source of empirical data about school shootings and managing those kinds of situations. This was published in 2002. There was a whole wave of trainings that uh, went across the country. OK. Um, we're going to skip through a couple of these slides because we're running short on time. The notion here about dangerousness is that you're looking at risk factors, harm, and risk level. And the whole idea is that all of these things fall on a continuum. We use what's called structured professional judgment to understand whether something is of low risk, medium risk, or high risk. The other important point to keep uh, in mind is that Another aspect of difficulty in assessing threatening situations is the low base rate. Um, there's very few incidents that actually get carried through. There was a very large um, study that took place, just as an aside, um, in which they looked at the number of threats that occurred. And there was something like 160 threats that were documented within a school system um, in one particular year. And of those 160 threats, none of them resulted in violence. So again, it's a low base rate. You know, obviously, this was a school system that was well equipped to manage these kinds of incidents. But again, a, a pretty reasonable example how um, there's a low base rate. And when you have a student in front of you, knowing whether or not something's going to happen is a very, very difficult thing to do, even for an expert. OK, um, some contextual points. If there's any educators on the call, the notion is that your best practices are to collect data about your school system. And within your school system, collect data about your school. You can't just compare your school against the school in, in the other state. You can't make these statewide program. You really have to, uh, what I would call, individualize your school safety plan, your safe school climate plan that's unique to your school, whether it's elementary, middle, or high school. Okay. Um, just some other quick tips. Undefined public spaces that are unsafe, playgrounds, hallways, cafeteria, locker room, really important. And then again, knowing your contextual mapping of your school, the pattern of your school day, monitoring who's there, who's not there, having physical maps, and then documenting these issues. Now, last but not least, what we're going to talk about today is your threat assessment team. This is basically the model. You've got your principal or AP at the top, and then you've got a supportive team that can include any um, of these members or all of these members. And again, it's a case-by-case -case scenario. So in some situations, you're going to need a full team. In other situations, you may only need two of these people. But this is essentially a best practice model who's involved in the team. Um, and you can see that it's multidisciplinary in nature. So again, you've got a forensic model where you've got multiple sources of data, and then you've got a multidisciplinary team. All right, moving on. How do you do the assessment? Okay. This is the how-to part. You evaluate the threat. You make a decision, transient, substantive. You respond to the transient threat, resolved. If it's substantive, you decide the seriousness of it. And then you go on to make the decision. If it's very serious, we're going to have a forensic threat assessment evaluation. And that can be a multidisciplinary evaluation that's in-house. Um, as long as you feel equipped and trained to do so, you can bring in an expert to do the evaluation for you or be part of the team or you can bring an expert in to, con um, to consult on it. So just as an example, in some situations I'm brought in and I'm the person who is doing the full forensic psychological evaluation on the student, meeting with the parents, talking with everyone, collecting and organizing multiple sources of data. On other instances, it's, it's a very short phone call. We go through the issues, we discuss it, and then we um, have a, a couple follow-up phone calls, and that's a um, very minimal level of involvement. So again, Everything is, depends on, the, on, the, on a case-by-case -case basis. What's really important for you is, is, is the planning part, and doing the legwork to decide who's going to be on the team, what's everyone's role is going to be, how are we going to communicate information, 
How are we going to document information? You have to have protocols for doing these threat assessments. And then, of course, this is an ongoing thing. You have to have ongoing continuing education. And it's not just on doing threat assessments. It's on, all, it's on all of the incorporated issues, suicide, violence, mediation, forensic interviewing. And then, of course, having your list of experts. You always want to have a list of experts um, on the outside that you can reach out to who are able to assist you. So uh, once you make a determination, this is a child who needs um, anger management psychotherapy. This is a child who's going through a divorce, and he needs some counseling to help with this divorce. This is a child who's got um, a psychiatric problem that's been undiagnosed, and he also looks like that there's an addiction issue going on. So you have to have your outside and community resources and supports present. Um, procedurally, you want to interview the student making the threat. You may or may not want to do some psychological testing, depending on um, the issues and the concerns that you have. You want to review the educational records. You want to understand if there's criminal records involved. You want to do collateral interviews. You want to talk to the witnesses who witnessed the event of, of bullying or threatening or, or, or violence. You want to talk to the cafeteria staff. You want to talk to the janitor. These are all relevant people because sometimes they may see something and just feel that it's not in their role to be involved with this, but they may have very important information. And then, of course, there's the physical evidence which speaks for itself. That's another whole discussion how you get into that. Some of this requires law enforcement involvement. Some of it you can look at right at school. And sometimes I'll just have a student sit down with me and I'll pop open a web browser and say, show me your Facebook account. Let's take a look through your wall. Let's take a look through your photos. And um, believe it or not, most times they simply comply with that because they're afraid, they're concerned, and they'd rather, they'd rather com comply with that than make things worse. And then that gives you an opportunity to, to see what's going on in their inner world and if there's any recent activity that's concerning or consistent with the incident that you're investigating on the spot right there. Again, I spoke about some of the records. Um, and then, of course, that cell phone, that smartphone is really important, depending on if you've got a cyber texting or cyber stalking issue. Chances are that you're going to have to get the police involved for that one. These are other, other uh, collateral contacts, really important. Um, and then, of course, some of the issues that you're addressing. You want to look at these, these very key issues um, because these are some of the evidence-based findings that are going to support the notion that your threat is in the serious direction, it's falling down the moderate to serious side of the continuum, or staying in the mild side. Okay. And then, of course, you're also looking at self-appraisal issues. How does the student perceive themselves in this situation? Okay. Last two minutes. Okay. Um, parent interview, you want to understand their perception. Again, building a rapport. You want to learn about really important, critical, imminent threat issues, like is there an access to weapons in the house? Do we need to lock things up? Do we need to? I had a student uh, last year who had a very extensive knife collection, and we had to come up with an agreement that the parent would control access to the knife collection. Um, even, those, those, even though the knives were not part of the threat, having some control over that was a tremendous factor. Oh, excuse me, Eric, uh, just real quick, uh, I, I know a lot of people are, you know, would be willing to stay on unless you need to get going. Feel free, please, if I can say, please continue past 3 o'clock if you need to. Okay, yeah, so maybe we'll just, we'll just ink a lot another minute or two, and then we'll have uh, a moment for some questions uh, or chat questions that are emailed in. This might be a good time to do that if you want to. Um, okay, so again, what we're really looking at, how do you get resolution to this issue? We talked about the people doing the threat assessment. We talked about the how to do the threat assessment. We talked about interviewing the student, interviewing the victim, interviewing witnesses, interviewing collaterals, getting all of your collateral records. Now what's the response? The response is somebody has to make a, a decision. And this is the part that people were always very, very standoffish about and because it's hard. It carries a, a lot of responsibility. It carries a lot of legal responsibility. Um, and this, frankly, is a reason why a lot, of the, a lot of school systems have involved outside consultants because it, it can help buffer that. And, um, and it's, it's a wise thing to do, again, so you're not relying on just one person making a decision. It's, it's a team, team approach. But essentially, you know, we're making a decision about the student's fitness for reintegration into the school community. And you're thinking about, can we integ integrate the student in, and is the school community going to be safe? Is the victim going to be safe? Is the, is the identified student going to be safe? And then, of course, we're talking about risk management. What changes do we need to do to make um, the school safe? How do we manage risks? Because risk never goes down to zero. There's no such thing as no risk. OK? 
okay? You, you can never say with complete certainty, you know, it's not going to rain today, we're not going to have a storm, it's not going to be a bad winter, there's no, all these risk events, there's no such thing when we talk about risk management. We talk about low risk, um, and then we talk about, and, and then of course imminent risk trickles over into an event that's happening. So again, there's no such thing as, as active risk. When there's active risk, that means that uh, an incident of violence or an incident of harm is, is, is actually occurring. So it's, it's really important you anchor, your, anchor the notion of risk on a continuum. But the bottom line is, you know, this is where your safety support plan, your behavioral support plan, you've got those mental health treatment interventions in place. Safety, you know, you may decide that this is a student whose class needs to change, he needs to be, have lunch times in, in a different place, or it may be a, a temporary out-of-school placement. So again, there's a whole gamut and range of possibilities that are possible. These are some of them. Um, expulsion, of course, may be an option. Uh, it, may be, it may be a necessary option. Uh, temporary placement, looking at treatment, always monitoring going on. So monitoring with, with the school psychologist, monitoring with the guidance counselor. That is your ongoing closure in your school safety plan. Really important. And then, of course, you, know, you're, you may want to have, as you, as you develop programs for your school system or your school itself, you may want to start to, to develop some groups. So if you've got students of concern who are active bullies or um, have been identified as students of risk in terms of excessive teasing or just taking things beyond where they need to go, this is an opportunity to have a group therapy intervention or a one-to-one -one, an educational intervention. We call that psychoeducational. And then last but not least, of course, is parental involvement. Because if you don't have parent support on this, um, it, it's, it's, it's working against your, your efforts themselves. Finally, having follow-up communication, understanding that communication is really important. This is closure uh, and, document, and, and a way to document your closure of the incident. And then, of course, treatment I, I define with some specific issues. You know, is this crisis management treatment for the perpetrator? Is this trauma treatment for the perpetrator or the victim? So if we think back about the Robert Butler case, this was a kid who is experiencing a lot of loss, a lot of trauma-related issues. Um, so that was something that could have been a potential treatment intervention for him. And then again, looking at the underlying issues. And then, of course, for victims, you know, is this someone who is, is always the butt of the joke and they need some assertiveness training, they need some cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, really important to define these again as far part, part of your follow-up and safety support plan. Wow. So we covered um, everything in 33 minutes. Um, I think that's a record. Here's a couple of references for you. Um, Dewey Cornell and his colleagues have really um, identified and, and articulated a lot of these findings and plans and intervention strategies in significant detail. I certainly support you finding these. There's, a, there's another handbook of school safety. Uh, school Violence and Safety by Furlong and Jimerson. Um, I certainly recommend those. And if anyone has any questions for me, um, I, I'm happy to make myself available offline. You can email me, you can call, and uh, if there's any way that I can be supportive for what you're trying to do to create a safe school community, um, you can uh, certainly um, my doors, know that my door is always open as is the, the door of the other members of the, the alliance here. And you've got a, a huge pool of, of experts and, and specialists. And the knowledge base that's available amongst all of us is, is very wide and very deep. And I know that everyone is eager to um, collaborate and, and be supportive towards workplace and school violence issues. So on that note, thank you very much, everyone, for your participation. It was a real pleasure today. I hope this was uh, very eager, uh, very uh, informative for everyone that was present, and thank you. Uh, that was great, uh, Dr. Frazier. Tell you what, we do have some questions popping up. Um, one is, are you familiar with John Van Driel's work? That's D-R-E-A-L, Driel, John Van Driel's work. Um, not ringing a bell, but that doesn't mean uh, anything significant. Sure, that's something I start to. Um, uh, Salem Kaiser Schools in Oregon. Apparently, he does some uh, work in, in Oregon. That's wonderful. Uh, no, it sounds like something we'll have to do some research on and find out more about it. Another name that I'll just throw out there: I know, um, a school that I was recently consulting with. They are borrowing um, Dan Elwes's bullying program, prevention programs, and intervention programs. Um, he's out of out of Colorado, so that's another. It's O L O L W E U S is the last name. If you Google that, it'll pull up. 
Um, that's another great um, reference consideration um, with respect to bullying issues. But there's, there's certainly a, a, a wide variety of experts on all of these topics. So if I can agree, thank you very much for um, you know, being able to stay on. One note, again, for those of you, I see I know many people know how to use the question features. We've had a, a few questions in there. But uh, again, from your user interface, there's a point where you could um, click on questions. If you type something in there, then we can certainly read them aloud. I, I feel a little selfish here until um, we see the next question. Oh, of course, our favorite question is, um, we, of course, will get, we, we discussed earlier a copy of the PowerPoint. You may be able to put this in a PDF format. And if, uh, tell you what, if you send it to me, I can send that out in the auto reply to all the attendees. We can show them where they can download it from, from the email. Uh, does, does that sound good? Yeah, that certainly sounds fine. And I, and I think um, with Pat's permission, the, the slides will probably be up on, uh, on the uh, Alliance website as well for people to download. It's a pretty, it's a pretty heavy file. Um, I had some difficulty actually getting in, getting into the, the the network of a couple school systems, so that might be the easiest way. Um, but we'll we'll make it available one way or another. Absolutely, that sounds great. Uh, we have another question, and, and I think it, I, I caught it in your presentation, but maybe you can expand on um, where do security consultants fit into the picture? Good question. You know, security consultants, so that's a very broad word. I'm not sure exactly what that means. In my mind, a security consultant could be a school resource officer, could be a police officer, could be a private investigator. Um, uh, here in Connecticut and other school systems that I've consulted with, there, it's certainly in, uh, encouraged and endorsed, and I support it, having um, one of those types of people involved or present if that's possible, and certainly part of the team because they're most familiar with physical security. They have a lot of access to the students. They have a unique um, and specialized kind of training that can certainly contribute to the interventions um, in dealing with these issues. So um, I hope that answers the question. Certainly. I, I, if I may, I, I sort of took that uh, term as a third party consultant when you think of um, a security firm that does risk assessments and stuff uh, and, and things like that. Yeah, so security firms, you know, certainly this is um, an opportunity to go in and provide a solution to schools. I think that you have to think like a school system um, when you're doing this. And, and the notion is that uh, a school system, what's, what's uh, appealing to them is, is obviously having uh, research methodology and that's, that is consistent with the needs of their school system, um, that you've got a methodology that's research supported, and then thirdly, you know, when you're dealing with this issue, you, you have to have some sort of uh, mental health understanding, training, education, background, et cetera, et cetera. The reason is because you're dealing with, with parents, you're dealing with children who, in this kind of a scenario, you're, you're usually um, addressing and dealing with, with mental health problems. So if I, was a, if I was running a security firm, I would probably have um, a mental health person as, as a team member consultant, and I would probably have a, a retired education specialist or an active education specialist as part of, as part of the consulting team. Um, you can't do this uh, on a one-to-one. -one. You really have to have a team approach because there's psychological issues, there's educational issues, there's physical safety issues, and then there's legal issues. So you probably want to throw an attorney in the mix as well. Absolutely. Uh, what do you do when the student is exhibiting concerning behaviors but has not done anything that requires disciplinary measures? Yep, great question. So if the red flags, and this, this was a question that came up last week, um, if you've got a student of concern and you're concerned, document the concern, and this is where you need to start, start making clinical decisions. And the decisions are, do I need to get more information? Usually the answer is yes. How do you get more information? You spend more time talking with the student. You get to know them a little bit better. Maybe you refer them to the school psychologist so you can get some psychological testing done if, if, if you think that's going to help answer questions that you don't have the answers to. The other thing is you may want to talk with the parents, find out what's going on at home, things going, things going okay at home, find out what their social life is like. Okay? Maybe talk with one of, their, one of their friends and identify and say, hey, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a little bit concerned about Billy, you know, how things been with Billy, you think he's okay, is he injured? Talk with some of his teachers. So again, you know, more information gathering before you um, do something significant about it. Now, after you do all that information gathering and if, if, if the bar gets raised to the next level, 
then it's time to make an intervention. So do, this would be a preventive, a violence preventive intervention, which would be now you've identified hopefully your clinical concerns, you can articulate them, you can defend them, and you can make that would support the basis for referring this child for some kind of therapeutic intervention, psychiatric if necessary, or again some additional kind of monitoring. Wonderful. Uh, here's a, a, a real good question. I was wondering, are there specific ways to conduct this threat assessment in regards to students who are gang affiliated, or is it the same method that is used for general bullying? Yeah. You know, gang related issues, is there something a little bit different the way that's handled? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I've, I've assessed kids that are in gangs, but uh, not at that macro level, so I can't speak with full authority on this issue. That's the disclosure. But what I do know is that when you have gang issues, essentially what you're doing is you're getting into criminal activity and you're getting into, you're crossing over into um, delinquent, what's called delinquency issues. And when you have delinquency issues, the best resource is law enforcement. So you call up law enforcement, you call up your local detective, you set up a phone call, you set up a meeting, you say, listen, we've got a concern you know, regarding the, the 32nd Street uh, crew, and these are the concerns. And one of these kids is making threats of violence. Um, this is where it crosses over more into the side of delinquency, delinquency where you're dealing with more criminally based issues um, versus isolated events of threats or isolated events of bullying. You're dealing with a more chronic issue. So, I would find out gang unit, gang tactical force, get the police involved, and um, you're probably likely to get a lot of support there. Um, if there's one or two people that are um, particular within a gang unit, you know, then you can isolate those people. But I would certainly take a very multidisciplinary approach with that kind of a problem. Oh, here's another great question. I, um, would the school be responsible to pay for the psychological intervention if it is determined that it's needed and the parents cannot provide. And I'm sorry, if I could toss on something, it seems like there's two points here. There's the psychological intervention when there's the treatment, but there's also the psychological assessment in terms of um, uh, like determining level of threat. Who, who pays for that? Yeah, usually that falls onto the school system because now, at least in Connecticut, this is the way it's done. It's the school system's responsibility. If they need to bring in a consultant, it's the school's consultant, okay? Now, if, if the parents say, well, we want to have our own independent, that's another option, okay? They, they can have that involved, but then again, you're dealing with a qualifications issue. Um, if, when, if the student is referred for treatment and the, and, the, and the question is that the parents don't have the treatment, who pays for it? Well, if it's a referral or a recommendation coming from the school, the way it's done here is the school is responsible for paying for that. That's interesting. Uh, but so far, that, that was most of all of the participants' questions, um, and please keep sending them in, but now I'm going to squeeze in mine. Uh, Eric, we've talked before about uh, social media investigations, and you gave me a great example of when you could sit with the student participant subject and go through their Facebook with them. What are the legal or even ethical issues behind searching their social media activities? especially things like, you know, friending them while you're pretending to be uh, a 16-year-old boy. Yeah. Well, it, it, it's really important, and um, this is something that you have to look at your state laws. Talk to a lawyer who understands the, your, your security laws, your social media laws in your state, okay? When kids come in and I'm using my computer and going to their website and they're consenting to, to log in and I have them write a consent out saying, yes, I consent, you know, to go in and, and look at the website jointly on Dr. Fraser's computer with himself for this evaluation, then that's okay. There, it's my property, it's my evaluation, we're doing it. Um, it's kind of like a, a psychological test procedure. You know, I come with my psychological test, they, they give consent that they're going to participate, they take the test, I see what they do, I get to see their answers. So it's the same kind of thing. Now when you get into physical property, like, the, like all the smartphone issues, that's a different camp. Okay? Because usually the property is not the student's, it's the parent's property. And just because it's in the school doesn't mean that you have access to the property. Because it's not necessarily a weapon, so it can't be absconded and you know, checked out and taken apart. Um, what, it, what, what usually happens, and, and again, the access issues vary. Like in Connecticut, um, you can't be a psychologist and, and even if I had the equipment to do it, I couldn't go in and open up 
the, the student's smartphone and look through all their files and their text messages. I would have to be a licensed pr uh, private investigator or be a law enforcement officer to do that. Now I could sit in with a law enforcement officer or a private investigator who's doing that, but then those individuals would have to have the authority to be doing that. The way that they would have the authority to be doing that, the law enforcement officer would have to have probable cause. They would take the, they would perhaps issue an arrest, or perhaps they would just say, you know, we want you to voluntarily, you know, um, release this this smartphone to us so we can take a peekaboo through it. They'll do that, and then you know, then you have access, and then they have an opportunity. But again, each each police station, you know, may or may not have the kind of equipment to be able to do that, and then it just becomes a, a much trickier issue. But you always have to go back to the laws; they're always changing. Um, so it's laws, 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 CYA. Uh, sorry to be hitting you with uh, many legal questions, but uh, you mentioned with the child going through uh, their Facebook, um, the, the, their consent. Uh, the question is, how can a child, a minor, sign for and provide consent when they're underage? Is, is that something you would do that consent with their parents, or how does that work? Yeah, so what happens is um, when, this, when the child is meeting with me, um, I'm disclosed as the school's expert, and then the school has the parents sign a consent to, uh, for their child to participate in the evaluation. I explain the nature and purpose of the evaluation, and that's how I get permission um, to do that. Uh, so, sorry for another legal one, but uh, regarding um, judicial records, um, any uh, records that they have as a minor when they're charged as a minor, and then also with the health records, let's say the school and nurse happens to know about certain diagnoses or medications they're taking, what can be shared in that larger group uh, threat assessment team? Is there HIPAA laws, is there other laws, or within that need-to-know basis threat assessment team, is that okay to be divulged? Yeah, so um, two questions. One is the school nurse records, et cetera, et cetera. That all falls in my book under, the, under their educational file. Okay, if it's on school property, it happens at school, it's their educational file. And uh, it may be health records, it may be mental health records, but it's part of their school file. It's in there. I have access to that. I can review that. I have them scan it and email it to me sometimes before I even see the students so I can get going with things. As far as the judicial records, in most states, not every state, again, so you have to check state by state, in most states, um, juvenile records are sealed. So unless you're a party on the case, you have no access to them. That's the way it is in Connecticut. Um, chances are somebody's going to know if a, if a particular student has been on probation or has had juvenile charges before, and then you can search out and uh, find out if there's a probation officer, and then you would have to have uh, the parent sign a release. So the probation officer could be one of the collateral contacts in your evaluation. So that's the way that's the way I would do it. I always go with a stack of blank collateral contact forms, and as I learn information and find out who's involved in the student's life, then we just go down through the, the stack of collaterals and we sign them all off, and then they get executed, and then they're available for me or anyone else on the team to speak with. Sure. Thank you. That's excellent. Well, we, this is great. I, I, their presentation was so excellent, and, and all these questions are so good, too. Um, it's very helpful. Yeah, really, I'll just close on this point. Um, you know, this is, there's some things that we know right now. There's some things that we don't know right now, and there's things that we're going to, conti we're going to continue to find out. This is an evolutionary issue that we're addressing, and, and really uh, in the very early phases of getting good at it um, as a multidisciplinary group. So. I encourage everyone to keep asking questions, search for answers, know that the answers are going to change. Um, it's just the nature yeah. of the process. But you can start with a good, solid um, forensic and evidence-based model to get going, whether it's prevention, whether it's intervention, whether it's a school-based initiative, whether you're setting up a consulting strategy for school systems, um, and really offer top quality service um, in the name of safety. Thank you. Uh, say, uh, Pat, did you want to say any final words? I just want to really thank you, uh, Dr. Fraser. This has been an excellent webinar. Thank you so much for sharing your expertise and knowledge with us today. And thank all of you for coming on and uh, asking these uh, definitely challenging and thought-provoking questions. Um, I encourage you to follow up with Dr. Fraser. You have his contact information his phone number and his email, and uh, follow up with him. 
with your questions and with your needs. Um, again, all of the members of the Alliance are available to you. You can find us on our website, as you're seeing on the screen now. And I want to invite you to come back next week for uh, the renowned Barry Nixon. He's the executive director of the Institute for the Prevention of Workplace Violence. He's located in California. He's been doing this work for a very long time. Um, so please sign up and join us again on next Tuesday at uh, 2 o'clock. Thank you so very much. Thank you. I, as I, we mentioned before, we'll be sending out information. Um, you'll be getting an auto reply, and we'll be posting the slide, uh, the text of the handout on the website, so you'll be able to get to access that. And, and I'd also like to put in a, a special thanks to Johnny Lee because um, he's providing this platform for us. I know Johnny does uh, webinars all the time, and the Alliance is really grateful to him uh, as as a member of the Alliance to provide the platform for us to webinars. Thanks so much, John. You're welcome. Great. Say so, uh, one last thing. I, it, we're officially over. Uh, one way I, I like to um, to do is I do a little demonstration afterwards. I don't want to make this any sort of sales pitch. If, if this is certainly the, the end of the presentation on, on school violence prevention. But if you'd like to stick around, I could show you the e-panic button.